Pete, it's everywhere on the Isle of Lewis. Indeed, the island has been described as a peat floating in the Atlantic Ocean. The harsh environment of the blanket peat moorland would seemingly prevent people from surviving and thriving. But, ironically, the presence of peat was the bottom line for the development and growth of society on treeless Lewis, providing the main source of energy for keeping the house warm and the pot hot. The loss of a peat stack, or a good source of peat, was a serious threat. The great storm of the 29th of January 1869 swept away all the peat stacks from 50 houses in the Newton area of Stornoway. And in 1879, the crofters of Boster asked to be removed to Kirkibost as their peat moor was running out. This strong connection between the crofter and his source of peat was turned by the landlord's factors to their advantage. Unless rents were paid on a time, no peats could be cut. As a fuel, peat was very versatile. To bake bread, Sea water, soured flour to provide yeast and fresh flour were mixed in a greased pot and allowed to rise. The pot was placed in smouldering peat ash, which burns for hours, to give a wholesome loaf. The traditional black house had no chimney, and since the fire was burning constantly, the atmosphere was laden with peat smoke. The consensus amongst the medical men of the 19th century was that the antiseptic properties of peat smoke prevented TB, to which islanders seemed to have immunity. The peat reek could be a balm in other ways. In times of want, the fibrous material found on some peats was smoked in place of tobacco, although it was utterly vile. Until 40 years or so ago, the cutting and harvesting of peat was a communal activity that hadn't changed for centuries, using the same simple tools, the spade and the peat iron, or talishka. Changing lifestyle and the cheap availability of heating oil consigned the talishka and the peat stove to the buyer. Companionship Banter, the taste of outdoor tea, and the hand lotion effect of wet peat were balanced by the sore muscles, tortuous midges, and cold, wet, and windy days. Nowadays, the moorland is being exploited for other sources of energy as wind turbines start to appear. The first attempt to harvest the moorland of Lewis for commercial gain was over 160 years ago by the owner of Lewis, the fabulously wealthy and controversial James Matheson. Matheson was keen to exploit the natural resources of Lewis to help improve the living conditions of the crofters. A decade earlier, attempts had been made to extract paraffin from the peatlands of Dartmoor in Devon and in Ireland, but it produced only limited success. The newly discovered paraffin was a more efficient lighting fuel than the whale oil and candle wax then in use on the island. The Lewis Chemical Works ran from 1857 to 1874 and was recently described as one of the most enchantingly bizarre episodes of Scottish industrial history. So, 
If we want to extract paraffin from a peat, the first thing we need to do is to distill it. Now, distillation involves heating the peat, but in the absence of air, so that it doesn't actually burn, but it decomposes to produce various substances. Now, this little apparatus here uh, is a sort of a Lewis Chemical Works in miniature. Here we have the equivalent of the kilns where the peat was heated. So if we fill this up with some powdered peat, The peat I've chosen is the blackest of the peat, which contains the best tar. Um, peat near the surface of the ground tends to be quite fibrous and doesn't burn as well. But peat deeper down into the ground, the peat that comes off from near the rocks, then near the bedrock, tends to be very black when it dries out uh, and can be quite brittle, almost like coal and it contains a good quality tar. So we'll fill this up until we get it full. Now, this attaches like so. And as we heat the peat in here, it gets, it starts to decompose and any gases produced come down here and as they do so they cool. Now some gases uh, when they cool turn back to a liquid and the liquid collects in the bottom wee tube here, whereas some gases don't condense and they come out through this tube here. And we might be able to actually burn them because some of the products are quite combustible. When Henry Caunter, an amateur scientist and close friend of Matheson, started experimenting on Lewis Peat with promising results, Matheson financed the venture. The history of the project was recorded some years later by Donald Morrison of Stornoway, who was the builder and foreman of the works for their duration. In a document entitled the beginning and the end of the Lewis Chemical Works, 1857 to 1874, the operation is described, illustrated with diagrams along with tales of success and failure, toil and strife, monies made and lost, and the characters involved. Dr. Benjamin Horatio Paul, a rising star in the developing world of chemistry, was appointed to progress the works. A large production plant of kilns, condensers, scrubber towers, extraction fans and collecting vessels was built near Caunter's fledgling works.
Peat banks were opened up and a system of narrow gauge railways was established to bring the dried peat to the works. Eventually, three and a half miles of rail track were laid across the moor through cuttings, across bridges and along embankments to bring the dried peat to feed the kilns. The trucks were hauled by cable and steam-driven winch, assisted by sails hoisted if the wind was kind. Peats were also carried by barge on a canal which still holds water to this day. On the ground there is evidence of loading wharves and a simple lock system. The kilns were lit in 1860, creating much pollution to the nearby River Creed with its important salmon fishery. Stornoway was also polluted as the obnoxious fumes were blown over the town by the prevailing wind. The kiln operators were regularly knocked out by dense fumes only to be revived by having buckets of water thrown over them. After two years, overcoming explosions, failing apparatus, breakdowns, battling the weather and redesigns, success was achieved with the production of paraffin lighting oil branded as lignol, which was sold in Glasgow for three shillings and sixpence, or 17 and a half p per gallon. So these are the products of the distillation. A watery liquid. Then, if we scrape around inside the apparatus, with a bit of luck, you never know, you might find some tar. Oh, yes, there we are. Black gold. So we've got these four products. The gas that was burning, which was eventually used in the Lewis Chemical Works itself to raise steam in the boiler. We've got the watery liquid, which was used as a fertilizer in the to uh, help the castle ground, to help plant the, the new vegetation in the castle grounds. We've got the coke, which was used as a fuel. Um, it was actually sold at one point. And we've got the tar. And the tar is the important source of the paraffin and other substances. To produce paraffin, the peat tar needed to be refined, which involved redistilling and treating with various chemicals. The refinery was built six miles away in Garabost, next to the brickworks which Matheson had established in 1844 to exploit the abundant clay deposits of the area. Part of the works remains today, once used as a dwelling house and now used as a buyer. The scars of the works are still visible today near to the pits where the clay was dug. Another rail track was laid at Garabost to convey material to kilns in a glen about 400 yards away, where there was a good supply of essential water. Some of the railway sleepers are still in place to this day. Besides paraffin, other products were subsequently offered for sale. Lubricating oils and greases, ships anti-fouling, wax, pitch, coke and fertiliser. Demand was high and the market seemed as broad as the tracks of peatland providing the raw material. But within five years, all of Matheson's hopes were dashed. The recent discovery of American crude oil had sent the UK paraffin markets into chaos, just as the US fracking boom was to upset the North Sea oil sector 
150 years later. This decline of the Lewis Chemical Works was helped on its way by large-scale embezzlement and corruption by a group of workers who were able to line their own pockets by manipulating hapless Henry Caunter, who had become the manager after Dr. Paul had left the chemical works in 1862. The fires went out in 1874. Okay, so these are pieces from the original works that have been found by you sort of presently. Yeah. Yes. But tell me a bit more about what's here. Well, this is one of the sleepers from the Garabost rail track. Uh, a very rough-hewn piece of timber. And um, surprisingly, a lot of them are still intact in the ground. Uh, oh, this actually comes from the Creed Works, where the, Creed, where the peat was cut to distill it into the... to get the tar. Um, and... Uh, these are still used nowadays. You can see them around the island in various places, used as fence posts. <laughs> when the were... um, kiln block where the peat was uh, distilled was uh, made of thousands of bricks. Mm. And uh, um, when it was uh, when, when the peat works finished, the, the kiln blocks were, were broken up, but there were bits of brick everywhere. When you distill the, um, uh, the peat, then you end up with bits of uh, coky and solid tar. Okay. And you end up with what's called clinker. Oh, okay. Which is the molten remains of the ash. And it's, Ooh. it's a bit like something out of a volcano. Yes. And again, these were brought up by the, by the rabbits. So, oh, tell me a bit about this. Where was this found? Oh, this comes from the... Um, Garabos site of the works, uh, the refinery. Um, latterly it was used by John Morrison, the miller, as a cattle, as a, a feeding trough for his cattle. Uh, but originally it was probably the cap of a condenser on top of a vertical tube. Um, and the condenser separated the paraffin um, from the tar. Uh, mm. The tar was heated and the gases passed through this. Water was injected through here to cool the gases down to to um, extract the final bit of uh, paraffin from the from, from the from the uh, gases. The sometimes chaotic antics that occurred on the Lewis Moorlands all those years ago and the haphazard nature of the layout of the Lewis Chemical Works were aptly summed up by the chronicler Donald Morrison in a simple phrase, an enormous, reckless blunder. The Lewis Beatlands returned once more to peace. <laughs>